Thank you very much. As you heard, I'm a legal philosopher. So what I want to try to do is sketch the basic normative structure of these questions that have already surfaced this morning concerning humanitarian intervention. And I chose the term the new democratic interventionism. So let me begin by sketching possible forms of what I call democratic or liberal interventions. The first one I want to call the Iraq model. Uninvited direct intervention aiming at regime change and deploying one's own military means only. The second one I want to call the Libyan model a direct military intervention as an ally of armed insurgents that is forcible partisanship in a foreign civil war. Either, there are two subforms, so to speak, either with the dual aim of regime change on the one hand and a genuine R2P, responsibility to protect claim, on the other hand, that is protecting a foreign population or large parts thereof against its own government. That's what we witnessed in Libya. At least that's what we were told by the interveners there. And or with the sole aim of regime change in the target state. And the last one, the Syrian model. Indirect intervention by supporting armed rebels without direct military engagement of one's own. Now, my focus will be not on the Iraq model, because the illegality as well as illegitimacy of the intervention is rather obvious. I don't want to comment on that. Nor on other cases of forcible interventions for the sole sake of a regime change that the last century has witnessed quite often because they are illegal under international law as well as illegitimate from the perspective of political philosophy. Instead, I want to focus on the Libyan model, that is the direct military partisanship in a foreign civil war, in order to protect the population in the target state, but aiming at regime change as well. And on the Syrian model, indirect intervention in a foreign civil war by external support of armed insurgents. Now let me begin with the Libyan intervention. Was it justified, the blunt question goes, by a responsibility to protect, or R2P? I here ignore the question of legality of the NATO intervention, that is, whether we all know it was authorized by the Security Council of the United Nations. But the question that could be raised and has been raised quite often is whether it overstepped the constraints it was subjected to by the Security Council Resolution 1973, which in fact it did. It grossly did. I want to ignore questions of legality. I want to talk to you, as I said, as a legal philosopher. Rather, I want to focus on its legitimacy, its material justification, as it were, possibly under the principle of R2P. Just a word on R2P. It is not a binding norm of international law, as it is often taken for. It is not. But it is an emerging principle stating that each member of the international community has a dual responsibility, namely to respect the sovereign rights of states, but also to respect the rights and dignity of its own population. Well, that's not a very sensational new insight. It has been around for centuries, but it is important that it was underlined, it was put emphasis on by the international community. And more specifically, as set out in 2005 in the World Summit Outcome, each state has the duty to protect its own population from genocide, 
war crimes and civil war crimes, crimes against humanity, and ethnic cleansing. That is, from grave international crimes, according to Articles 5 through 8 of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Should national authorities manifestly, that's a quotation, manifestly fail to carry out their respective duties and should peaceful means be inadequate for a remedy, forcible intervention in accordance with Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter is a possible option for the international community. Now, a remark on the normative character of the R2P. R2P stipulates a, what legal theorists call a positive duty. That is, not to abstain from something, but to actively promote something, grant, support, and protection. In contrast to negative duties that prohibit things, Positive duties are indeterminate in their content. They can usually be discharged through a range of means and in a variety of ways. If you're prohibited from killing somebody, all the million ways to kill other, peoples are, as other people are prohibited. If you're compelled to save other people's, people's life, you may have a whole range of means to do so, and only one of them you're obliged to take and realize. Which of these is permissible, necessary, and adequate depends on the concrete circumstances of the individual case, on the factual possibilities of the person or authority obliged, and on their legal limitations. Therefore, for each possible case of forcible intervention, the principle of R2P poses the problem whether force is justified, the so-called threshold question, rather than providing us with an answer. If you're obliged to help somebody, that duty alone does not tell you which ways you can, which means you can employ to discharge your duty. Uh, rather than providing us with, with an an answer. But then what does provide us with an answer? Conditions of legitimacy. The use of military force for R2P purposes stands in need of justification in two different ways. First, with respect to the sovereignty of the target state, and second, with regard to the people there whose lives would be endangered by the massive deployment of measures of modern warfare. Let me say a word on sovereignty. Sovereignty means self-determination, in a broad sense, autonomy. That is, a positive right to self-govern one's affairs according to one's own decisions and second, a negative right against external interference, hence a good of paramount interest to every state and people. The playing down of sovereignty, which has become fashionable in the last couple of years, is completely misguided. As a negative right, it constitutes the legal standing of a state and thus a precondition of lawful relations among states, that of their equality as legal subjects. However, the sovereignty of a state, as opposed to the autonomy of individual persons, is not an end in itself. It is derived from a permanent process of justifications uh, justification by its citizens. That's the normative perspective that can be taken on sovereignty as well as a descriptive one. Only a state that by and large is legitimate. I introduce here the notion of illegitimate states. Only a state that by and large is legitimate in that sense can rightly claim its sovereignty and thus repel 
others' interferences. Now let me make an important distinction, a, a distinction as to legitimacy of a, of a state. We have to distinguish between internal legitimacy, that's vis-a-vis -vis its own citizens, and external legitimacy vis-a-vis -vis other states. The difference is rather large. Internal legitimacy is, normatively speaking, much more demanding. A state may lack it thoroughly without losing its external legitimacy. Think of the late German Democratic Republic, delegitimized by its population, but of course not a legitimate target for some sort of humanitarian intervention. That is only the case, and external legitimacy only be denied if a state turns its principal function on which is its justification as a compulsive order rests. States are compulsive legal orders. They need justification for their sheer existence, namely the basic protection of inner peace into its antonym. A state who does that loses even ex its external legitimacy. That means only, only qualitatively extreme and quantitatively comprehensive violations of this most fundamental duty of a state towards its own citizens may lead to the forfeiture of its external legitimacy and thus its autonomy towards other states, its sovereignty. A state that commits Grave international crimes on a large scale against its population may lose its external legitimacy entirely. Therefore, the criterion grave international crimes is decisive for the material justification of R2P interventions. A state, one may say, that perpetrates such atrocities in a systematic way does not fulfill its fundamental task anymore, which solely can justify its existence as a compulsory legal system. By losing not only its internal, but also its external legitimacy, it forfeits its claim to sovereignty. The latter no longer stands in the way of a foreign humanitarian intervention. Take Nazi Germany, for a terrible example. However, there are still the rights of uninvolved innocent people. Against a state that has become externally illegitimate, others have no duty to respect its sovereignty anymore, but they still have unaltered legal and ethical duties towards its entire population, that is, including those who disapprove of the intervention. The use of force to protect people must find, I want to put it that way, its limits somewhere in the costs in lives and suffering forced on uninvolved others. There were tens of thousands of victims in Libya. The intervention was waged in order to save exactly those people whose lives it took. In this respect, international humanitarian law, the use in Bello, faces a host of unresolved problems, the gravest among them being the legal acceptance of collateral killings on grounds of military necessity. I don't want to go into that. Whatever. The final justification of an intervention, it certainly requires a set of fine-tuned criteria for weighing the colliding rights of potential victims. As, as stated by the UN High-Level Panel on More Secure World, our shared responsibility in 2004, in each individual case, military force can only be justified in the presence of a serious threat for a proper purpose, as a last resort, involving proportional means 
and if military force is likely to have an appropriate balance of consequences, that is, better results than inaction. I have serious doubts, to be honest, that any of those was really met in the Libyan case. But let me focus on the balance of consequences question. Rebels, 50,000 victims in Libya. That was at the end of August, 2011. And afterwards, this year, this article came out saying, for most of 2011, Libya was in the midst of a bloody civil war. Now as many as tens of thousands of citizens are missing. Let me quote Anders Fogg Rasmussen, the General, Sec uh, General Secretary of NATO. The operation in Libya was one of the most successful ones in NATO history. I don't exactly know what he means in talking about a humanitarian intervention in order to protect people from being killed. Or 30 at the end of the intervention. Oh, one of Libya's most modern towns, says BBC News, 30 has been blasted to smithereens. One has to take that into account and not only stare at the bad dictator, which Gaddafi certainly was. Appropriate balance of consequences with regard to the other goal of the intervention, the democratic regime change, we have known for decades, actually, that foreign-imposed regime change does not really promote democratic development in the target states. This article proposes that foreign-imposed regime changes make civil war onset more likely. Was it a just war in Libya? The blunt answer is no. I see no way to materially justify NATO's intervention even for the alleged purposes of R2P. Much less so for the arrogated, unauthorized purpose of a democratic regime change in Libya. Millions of Libyans who have survived this protective support will have to put up with its stark consequences for years, maybe even decades to come. Now let me switch to the Syrian model. Democratic interventionism as support of armed insurgents and that has, normatively speaking again, a first premise. Is there a right to democratic governance for each people on Earth. Here I sketch possible foundations for such a right to democratic governance. The normative superiority of democratic governance over all other forms of governance. From a legal ethical perspective, one would say the consequentialist values that are promoted by democracy that was the perspective of John Stuart Mill. Higher efficacy of democratic systems for desirable goals. That has been proven correct, I guess, by and large, correct. Strategically, rulers must observe the interests of the citizens in order to achieve their re-election. And epistemologically, the participation of citizens assures better insight into their real interests and concerns. And subjectively, participation improves a public-spirited sense of communal affairs and promotes individual autonomy. But there are also intrinsic normative values in self-governing of peoples. Inherent, an inherent element of fairness in democratic rule, respect for freedom and equality of every individual. Let me just briefly summarize that. From the perspective of international law, we distinguish between two elements of 
democratic governance. The procedural element, free and fair elections, of course. But a material element must come to that. The rule of law, human rights, civil liberties, legal e equalities, and a few more. Both these elements are protected in numerous international covenants. Even though, as of yet, there is no comprehensive individual right to democracy in international law, the entire United Nations system is committed to the global promotion of democratic governance. And that's what it amounts to with regard to Syria. Hence, Syrian citizens did, in fact, have a right to resist the despotic regime of Bashar al-Assad in their country. But did they also have a right to unleash a bloody civil war? Which is a different question, of course. The blunt answer is no. Here's why. An organized violent rebellion, a civil war, stands in need of justification in two ways. With regard to the oppressive regime as the direct adversary in the armed insurgency, and with regard to the fellow citizens, in particular those who reject the insurgents without thereby becoming partisans of the tyrant. Maybe they have families, and hence a valid moral reason to reject the risk for, their, for the lives of their loved ones in a civil war. Tens of thousands of women and children have been killed in Syria so far. The first perspective is that of a collective self-defense against the tyrant. Such a justification may not be too far-fetched in certain situations. But what about the second perspective? The need to justify my armed rebellion vis-a-vis -vis my neighbor who has a wife and five kids and does not want a civil war. How do I justify the insurrection towards him? The one concerning one's fellow citizens who might have profound moral reasons to reject the armed rebellion. Starting such an insurgency, and now I'm speaking as a legal theorist again, amounts to forcing a kind of coercive solidarity with one's own aims on uninvolved, nonpartisan others who do not and do not morally have to share those aims. My neighbor with his five kids. If at all, the principle that could justify such coercive solidarity is obviously not self-defense. I'm not a, being attacked, or the rebel in Syria is not being attacked by his peaceful neighbor. It is a principle of necessity. It is obvious that the limits imposed by this principle on claims to coercive solidarity must be very narrow, a forced on solidarity. What they certainly do not encompass are forced sacrifices of others' lives. No one is obliged to have his or her own life sacrificed for the aims of others. Applying these principles to the situation in Syria before the civil war amounts to that. The Assad regime was and is a despotic regime guilty of many human rights violations though it has never been quite as sinister as, as the regimes in Saudi Arabia and Qatar who suddenly detected their love of democracy, if only in Syria. This fact entitles Syrian citizens to all forms of peaceful resistance, civil disobedience, the fact that al-Assad is a despot. It may even justify the use of armed force against al-Assad's machinery of oppression, though I do have serious doubts as to that. It is, however, far from justifying the unleashing of a civil war that foreseeably has cost over 100,000 lives so far. 
Certainly, violent insurgency developed gradually and usually due to atrocities on both sides, as did the one in Syria, where apparently it was the government that began to use massive disproportionate force. Nevertheless, let me make this perfectly clear, the taking up of arms on the part of the insurgents was also a grave moral wrong. From this it follows that the three major Western powers who fueled the civil war by supporting the bloody insurgency in various ways have also incurred grave moral guilt. Public international law, by the way, confirms that. It strictly prohibits any such intervention in support of an armed rebellion. And if you, in case you have any doubts about the fueling of the civil war in Syria by the three major Western powers. This is New York Times, with help from the CIA. Arab governments and Turkey have sharply increased their military aid to Syria's opposition fighters. And even as the Obama administration, I come to the end, I know, I'm stressing my time, uh, has publicly refu refused to give more than non-lethal aid to the rebels. The involvement of the CIA has shown that the United States is more willing to help its al Arab allies support the lethal side of the civil war. And here again, appropriate balance of consequences, a democratic goal, it won't work. And we've known that. Science has known that for decades. Foreign imposed regime change is likely to spur resistance and civil war in those countries where the United States and other advanced democracies are most likely to undertake such intervention. Actually, there's a better way. Why civil resistance works. Conclusion. Neither the direct intervention in Libya nor the indirect one in Syria can be justified on grounds of the intervener's aim to replace an existing despotic regime by a democratic rule. From any normative perspective, be it legal or ethical, the whole idea of democratic interventionism is deeply misguided and reprehensible. This is aggravated by the bleak political outlook for any such intervention as demonstrated exemplarily and terribly in Iraq. The West should give up this infamous idea, and it should end the violent policy it has grounded it thereon. Thank you very much.